Hi guys, welcome to Brisbane. Behind me is the Queensland Brain Institute where I'm gonna be working. Um, and today is actually my very first day coming into the lab, gonna attend my first lab meeting. Uh, before I show you around the lab, which I'm not even super familiar with yet myself or introduce you though, I wanna give you guys a little more background on cephalopods, their biology, their nervous systems. So this video is gonna be a little bit longer because we've got some information to get through, but bear with me, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I will start answering questions from students in my next video. So make sure you pass question, any questions you have along to your teachers. Just don't have time in this one because like I said, we've got some biology and neuroscience to get to. All right, let's get started. All right, guys, let's get down to some cephalopod science. Okay, the cephalopods, remember that's the octopus, cuttlefish, squid family. They have complicated nervous systems. So an octopus, for example, has over 500 million neurons. Now you have about 80 billion. So that's still small compared to a human nervous system, but it's one of the largest brain to body size ratios of any invertebrate. Remember invertebrates are animals without a skull and a spine. Um, but they have a totally different organization from our brains. Gross anatomy is completely different. Even some of the genetics and genetic regulation can be different. That's because our last common ancestor with cephalopods was probably about 750 million years ago, and it was a little flatworm that crawled around in the bottom of the primordial oceans. A lot has happened evolutionarily since then. So I talked last time about the fact that um, octopuses and other cephalopods are capable of complex behaviors about you know, cognitively may, may be on the level of a kindergartner. Um, so those complex behaviors are enabled by sensory systems. So I wanna talk a little bit more about their sensory systems because that's what I'm interested in, chemosensation, and the lab I'm in here at UQ is really interested in the visual system as well. So complex sensory systems include, uh, that includes the high resolution camera style eye, um, olfactory pits that detect chemicals in the water that are located also near the eye, um, an organ called a statocyst, which detects gravity, movement, and sound. That's similar to the way your inner ear detects like acceleration of your head. That's what makes you motion sick or something like that. Um, and also their skin has sensors in it, just like our skin has sensors in it. They detect things like touch and water movement. Arms, though, deserve an extra lot of attention in cephalopods because they're super cool. So a lot of my pictures today are going to be from octopuses, um, but arms are also very important in cuttlefish, squid, um, the other members of the cephalopod family as well. So the amazing semi-autonomous arms. So more than 60% of all the neurons in an octopus or, a, or cuttlefish or something um, but especially in the octopus, are found in the arms. So how do these arms work? Let's pause for a moment and understand how your arms work. So in your arms, if you want to move your arm, like if you touch something and want to pull your arm away, um, you have two basic kinds of movement, reflexes and voluntary movements. A reflex means that a sensory signal comes in, goes to your spinal cord, and then the signal is immediately sent back out to the muscle, like in this example. If you touch something hot, that pain neuron sends its signal through a nerve in your arm, which is a bundle of axons, through a structure called your dorsal root ganglion and into your spinal cord, somewhere in like the back of your shoulders or your neck. There, the signal is relayed to a motor neuron. That motor neuron comes, sends its axon back out through a nerve, to your muscle tells your muscle to contract, withdrawing your arm from the potentially dangerous, painful, burning stimulus. So that actually is really fast. You don't need your brain for that. That just works through the spinal cord. Typically takes tens of milliseconds um, for those kinds of reactions to occur. So the signal then will also be sent from the spinal cord up to the brain. So your brain will say, oh, hot, right? And you can take further action. But these reflexes are designed to have the shortest possible path through the nervous system to move you as rapidly as you can away from the potential danger. 
but you can also have voluntary reactions. So maybe you're trying to reach into your backpack without looking and feel for your cell phone, right? So in that case, sensory signals about, you know, from what you're touching um, are going to your spinal cord and up to your brain. Your brain's processing that information. When it recognizes the shape and texture of your phone, it sends a, sense, it sends a motor signal through your spinal cord to your muscle. You grab the phone and pick it up. That will typically take, you know, forget about the feeling around time, but just for the sort of reaction, um, will typically be on the order of hundreds of milliseconds rather than tens of milliseconds. Okay. So that's how your arms work. Your spinal cord and your brain are really in charge, not your arm. Your arm is just there to pass information to your spinal cord and brain where the processing is being done. Different in an octopus. So in octopuses, the arms are made of mostly muscle and nerve, right? No bones. So we have different kinds of muscle that run in different directions surrounding this central nerve cord. The nerve cord consists of axon tracts on the top. So that's sort of like the nerves in your arm, right? They just relay information. But below that is a structure called the ganglia. And the ganglia has nerve cell bodies in it. So that's where actual processing of information can occur. The arm nerve really functions like a spinal cord, right? Sensory information can come in and motor reflexes and commands can go out um, within the arm. The arms can move and respond after amputation because they have all the reflex structures they need. Your arm could not do that, right? Because even the most basic reflex, the information has to go to your spinal cord and come back out. But an octopus can have that reaction within the arm. Further, they can respond to touch, chemicals, and even light from an octopus arm. So an octopus, you can think of as having a brain and eight spinal cords, rather than thinking of it as akin to your arm nerves. They're much more akin to eight spinal cords. Turns out the suckers on octopus arms are full of sensory neurons. So this little picture I took, this is a little bit of octopus arm, and I stained it with a blue dye selectively taken up by neurons. And what you can see is there's a little bit of blue on the skin of the main arm there, scattered in little tiny blue dots, scattered in with some black and yellow dots. The black and yellow dots are part of their camouflage system. That's a whole other topic maybe we can talk about later. Um, but on the suckers here, you see tons of blue dye has been taken up. These octopus arms are not normally blue. All that blue dye has been taken up by all the sensory neurons present on the suckers. The suckers have a sense of touch, very acute, like your fingertips. They also do, can do chemosensation, which is identifying chemicals that they come into contact with, much like your tongue or your nose identifies chemicals. The suckers can help with do object recognition and decide whether an object is worth holding on to or releasing. Another study by that same Nesher um, in Israel, this study, they took a petri dish and they coated it either with an octopus skin extract, a fish skin extract, or just a control coating, right? Um, which is like, it was like a gelatin that they mixed the octopus and fish skin with. Um, and here's what they saw. They saw, what they did was they took an amputated octopus arm and they let it attach to the petri dish. And then they measured how much force does it take to pull the arm away from the petri dish or pull the petri dish away from the arm. So on control ones that were just coated with plain gelatin, they measured how much force and they actually set that as 100%. So that was like baseline force, the amount of force needed to pull the control petri dish away from the arm. When they coated the petri dish with octopus skin extract, they found it took much less force to pull the petri dish away than it did to pull it away from a control dish. Cool. That's actually smart because an octopus doesn't want to grab onto itself, right? If these arms are making decisions without checking in with the brain, right? These are just like reflex loops in the arm. Then you don't want the arm to like touch something and reflexively hold on to itself or it would get all tangled up. So if it detects octopus skin, it releases and won't hold on compared to control. However, if it detects skin extract, it holds on tight. So this was significantly stronger than octopus. It was not significantly stronger than control. Okay. 
They might have been able to find that if they had more data. They only tried the first skin extract on four arms, the octopus skin extract on eight arms, and the control on eight arms. But they did find it holds on strongly to fish skin extract and control petri dishes, and it releases octopus skin extract. Again, all of that is happening just in the arm because that was an amputated arm, no brain. That's just the arm nerve cord making that decision. So in summer 2018, I had my first chance to work with cephalopods. Um, so I was spending the summer at this beautiful location, which is the Marine Biological Laboratories in Woods Hole, Massachusetts on Cape Cod, um, with this, that's me on the left and my student Caitlin on the right. Um, and we were out there for the summer and we designed a set of experiments that we originally designed to work with squid, pictured in the upper left here. Um, it's a long story, but it turns out the squid experiments didn't work at all. So we were lucky. We had the opportunity to switch and work with some juvenile octopus. That's shown in the lower right. Those experiments worked great. So I'm going to tell you about the octopus experiments. Okay, so we wanted to know, could we record activity in the nervous system when those suckers on the arms were tasting things or detecting chemicals? So here's how we did the experiment. We used juvenile octopus bimaculoides, a species of two spot octopus from native to the Pacific, um, and we were using young ones. And we would amputate a little bit of an arm, sort of like half or two thirds of an arm. Don't worry, it grows back. You can see in this picture here, but you can't really see because my, my little thumbnail, which I can't move, is covering part of it. You can kind of see in the big picture, um, there is an arm that has been amputated on the far right side, and you can see a little baby arm is starting to grow back there. So they do lose arms in the wild and are capable of regenerating them. So we would anesthetize the baby octopus, amputate an arm, and then recover the animal, let it recover um, and regrow. Okay, so once we had that amputated arm, we would attach it to an electrode that is shown here, labeled in the picture, and then we would apply stimuli through a little um, tube down in the bottom right of the picture, um, and the stimuli we tested were fish skin extract to represent prey, octopus skin extract to represent self-recognition, like in that previous study by Nesher. We also used amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein and are present in a lot of prey um, as a signal. Um, we also tried squid and octopus ink, which can be a signal of danger in the environment. And we used, for our control, we just pushed plain seawater onto the arm, which is what they were already bathing in, so that wouldn't really be any difference except maybe a little change in water motion or pressure. Okay, and this electrode is designed to record the activity in that whole arm nerve cord. Any activity in the arm nerve cord that should be being sent back to the brain, we can record through that electrode. All right, so I'm gonna show you some examples because it turns out these arms didn't only give us electrical information, they behaved, right? Because as I said, an amputated arm can move and respond to stimuli. So. Here is an example of an octopus arm hooked up to the electrode. So the yellow tube there is actually the electrode. And we're going to show you what happens when we um, pipette filtered seawater as our control onto the arm. All right, so there's the arm. It's only attached to the electrode. We pushed a little seawater onto it. It maybe wiggled or jiggled just a little bit, but it really didn't react. Okay. So here's what happens when we put fish skin extract onto the arm. So here comes my pipette again, push in the fish, fish skin extract, and immediately the arm starts moving. It actually reaches toward the fish skin. It's like, where is it? Okay, and the suckers, you could watch suckers would kind of extend and come back, feeling around looking for this fish skin extract. So we were thrilled that was working so beautifully. Well, we really were there to record the electrical activity. So here is what we got. So here is a recording for um, of the electrical activity in the arm. So when the when it's sort of flat, that means no change in electrical activity in the arm nerve cord. When you see big up and down um, changes, that's when lots of action potentials are traveling down the many many axons in that nerve cord. So many neurons are firing action potentials, um, and we get this big ch -ch 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 electrical activity. Okay. So these two examples, we've got seawater control on the left. There might be sort of a little few flicks of action potentials in there that might be spontaneous activity of arm nerves doing some other business, or that might be a little bit of a reaction to the water movement, right? Because arms can detect water movement too. 
Um, but then by comparison, you see on the right hand side, when we put fish skin extract in, oh boy, we get a big response, right? And it's sustained for a couple of seconds. You can see my little scale bar here, millivolts, that's the amount of change in electricity, um, is the up and down, and then right to the right left, that is time, right? So we're just watching the electrical activity over time here, and that's half a second is the little scale bar. Okay, let's look at some more. So octopus skin extract, we got a good response to octopus skin extract, right? You can see big response there. Um, we also got a response to amino acids. Here I'm showing you glycine, um, but yeah, any amino acids we tested, we got good responses to. Um, and then finally down here at the bottom, octopus ink, no response. Octopuses definitely detect each other's ink and they change their behavior accordingly, but they're not detecting it through the sucker because the sucker shows no response at all to octopus ink or squid ink for that matter. Um, we suspect that they can detect that through those olfactory pits up by their eye, not on their arms. So different parts, different sensory systems are detecting different stimuli. Okay, so we saw strong responses to all stimuli that we tested except the ink and of course the filtered seawater control. So FSW is filtered seawater control. This graph is a little complicated. So on the y-axis is number of events, that sort of number of up and down deflections in our recordings that go up or down below us, above or below a certain threshold. Um, so for filtered seawater, we saw little to no response. The next category of stimulus there, we've got all the stimuli across the bottom, is pinch. So we actually, uh, that was our negative control was filtered seawater. Our positive control where we expect to see a response was to just lightly pinch the tip of the arm with a pair of plastic forceps. So when we did that, um, we saw a good response, right? We saw a number of action potentials um, in all of our arms. So these boxes are kind of, this is where again, the graph is a little complicated. The dot in the middle is the average. Then the horizontal line in the middle of the box is the median. The whole, the top and bottom of the box is 25th and 75th percentile. So, you know, the middle set of all the re reactions fall within that box. And then what we call the whiskers, the little error bars that pop up and below the box, um, those are the 90th and 10th percentile responses. So that gives you sort of pretty much the full range. The little asterisk above a box indicates that it's significantly different from the filtered seawater control. So filtered seawater control on average produced like, you know, less than 50 um, events, right? Those electrical changes. Um, and whereas pinch produced on average more like 300 electrical events, that was significantly more, statistically speaking, than control, right? The statistical test we ran down here um, was either a paired Wilcoxon test or a Kruskal Wallace. Don't worry about that. That's fine. It was just a statistical test that was appropriate for this style of data. Okay, fish skin also, right? Lots of events, much bigger response than filtered seawater. Um, glycine, much bigger, that's our amino acid, much bigger response. Methionine, another amino acid, much bigger response than filtered seawater. Um, on a smaller set, so we did that on 15 arms. On a smaller set, subset of arms here, we have filtered seawater, pinch in nine arms, octopus skin in nine arms, octopus ink in four arms, and squid ink in five arms. The reason that happened is because we couldn't get an octopus to ink for us. They were not afraid. So, I, <laughs> so initially we were testing them with squid ink because I could get a hold of squid ink. Um, and then eventually we got an octopus that inked at us, collected the ink real quick. Um, and we're able to test the remaining four arms with octopus ink. But either way, they didn't respond. Okay, so the result, we can measure arm chemosensation. We can measure activity in the nervous system in response to those arms and suckers detecting chemicals in the environment. That is supported by some old anatomic studies from the 60s that said, yes, there are these little sensors on the sucker that look like chemosensors, that look like kind of like taste buds or olfactory neurons. And it fits with known behavior like the Nesher studies, right? That found that the octopus arm by itself could decide to suck on or release something based on chemical cues. So future directions, what else can these animals detect? We just 
suggested a really limited range of stimuli. There's all kinds of potential stimuli in the ocean. Um, so it'd be great to find out, test more stimuli. Um, how does chemosensation trigger motor patterns? What's the loop? What's that reflex arc through the neurons in the arm? We don't know. I would love to know. And this is where we're getting toward my new work. What about other cephalopods? So in some ways, this wasn't super surprising in octopus because we have know there's a lot of behavior, more behavioral and anatomic data about octopus chemosensation than any other cephalopod. But there's a lot of other cephalopods in the sea. Okay, a little epilogue. We did publish our paper, if you're at all curious. Um, it's in a journal called the Biological Bulletin. We published it in early 2020. Caitlin went, graduated from Denison um, in 2019 and um, got a job. She was able to go back to the marine biological labs and work there for two years studying neural regeneration. Um, and then she went on and she has now started a PhD in neurobiology at Duke University where she is working now. Okay, so remember the cephalopod family tree, I showed this to you last time, right? Octopus is up here um, in that sort of peachy pink colored area. But there's all these other cephalopods, all these decapods, for instance, cuttlefish and squid, little things called your primna and bobtails and all kinds of great stuff. So I'm really curious about how all of those animals could potentially be tasting and smelling as well. So here in Queensland, there's all kinds of native cephalopods. Um, so in this picture, you can see in the upper left, we've got a cuttlefish. Upper right is the blue ringed octopus. Um, which I'm going to get to work with soon. They are crazy toxic. They actually produce a toxin called tetrodotoxin, and if they bite you, they can kill you. So I'm going to learn how to work with it safely. But blue ringed octopus, very cool. Um, we have down here uh, the little iridescent guy is called a bobtail squid. It's not actually a squid, it's just called that. Um, below that in the center, the stripy one is called the pajama squid, also not exactly a squid, it's actually a cuttlefish. Um, and then we have an actual squid um, in the right. Okay, so these are all five of these are some of the many native species of cephalopod that are in this area that I could potentially work with. The trick is I have to catch them. Luckily, there's some experts here who can help me do that. So what are my plans? I would like to explore some cephalopod behavior and then also repeat some of the physiology I did at Marine Biological Labs. So I would like to know for behavioral testing, things like can animals find a hidden object by smell, right? Smell being sort of distance chemo sensation. So I wanna do experiments where I do things like put a little bit of food um, in a tube and then have some other tubes that have nothing in them or have seaweed in them or other things um, and then put a cephalopod in the tank and see what they do. You know, video record them, see where do they spend their time? Do they immediately go get the food? Do they hang out near the tube with the food? Do they ignore it entirely because they can't see it? Um, so I'm curious to know if they can use chemo sensation at a distance to help them detect and find food. Different cephalopods may do this differently, right? Like an octopus may be great at this task and a squid may not care at all, right? So that's, um, I'm interested in that. I'm also interested in, do they touch, strike at or hold objects more if they have been coated with chemical cues than if they have not been coated with chemical cues. So sort of like the Nesher study with the octopus arm, but I would like to test this with live living animals um, and see like, for instance, is a squid more likely to strike a target if it's been coated with fish skin extract than if it's, um, you know, got a control coating on it? Are they more likely to handle an object um, for longer if it's been coated with something than if it hasn't been? Or could we even find something that's repellent? Like could we use like an anemone extract and then they'd be less likely to touch it, right? So I'm very curious um, about that. Okay, finally, physiology. I'd like to repeat some of those experiments I did before with the octopus arm, maybe looking at arms of, like I said, bobtail squid, um, pajama squid, other, other little critters. Um, and in the lab I'm working with, there's a lot of really cool anatomy and some cool genetics. And so um, I may get the opportunity to collaborate with them on some of those kinds of projects, even though that's not um, necessarily my normal uh, line of work. So acknowledgements and how to learn more. So first of all, I wanna thank you and your teachers for watching this long video and learning all these things about cephalopods with me. Medicine, um, my home institution, um, 
the Grass Foundation who funded all of that work I did in MBL, um, the MBL Cephalopod Initiative for their tremendous help in training me to work with those animals, Licking County Foundation and University of Queensland, Licking County Foundation is supporting some of my work here, um, and University of Queensland for hosting me. And then I put a few things down here, um, books, documentaries, and even a podcast if you want to learn a little bit more about cephalopods and their awesome behaviors.